Um, but it's the 13th of December, and uh, I've got an Advent uh, talk for us today. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Now, normally when you hear Matthew read at Christmas time, especially if you go to a nativity play at a school, or if you were used to go to those, I remember going to those to sit for what felt like five hours for the 15 seconds when my kid would do something. I've got, I've got old videos of my kids with tea towels on and everything else for their few seconds when they did what they did. Um, but these verses are always missed because they're rather boring. It's a list of names. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, we're actually going to read them in a moment. Um, and I'm going to prime you as I read them with the four things I'm going to share. And the test to keep you awake is this. As I read the verses, see if you can spot these four things in them. Now, even though they're often met in the King James Version of these verses 1 to 17, is we get the word begat. So and so begat, so and so begat, so and so begat, so and so. Modern translations turn that into was the father of. But these are the begats, and that was the premise for the talk today. Um, Inside job, you'll see what that's about. But the verses that normally get missed at Christmas, but there's some absolutely astonishing things in here for us this morning. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Uh, Paul reminds us, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness. So four things as I read these verses to you. God takes his time. God breaks into history. God gives us rest. God gives us identity. So I'm going to read the verses and see if you can spot these four things. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of (laughs) Aminadab, I was going to practice this so I didn't get it wrong, (laughs) Aminadab the father of Nation, Nation the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, who was the mother of Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. You with me so far? Any names stand out to you there? David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Are you still with me and awake? Last one. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of... I can't even say that. Shiltiel, Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Elikim, Elikim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. <gasps> got there. But if you're like me, often you just go, yeah, 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 begat, 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 just skip that bit. And that's what happens. But these names are here. We're going to discover four reasons and why this genealogy is here and why it is vital for us. And maybe you've never heard a talk on the begats. So here we go. Four things. God takes his time. In other words, time is his. It's the first thing to share from this. All of time is God's, not ours. We're obsessed with our time, aren't we? How much time we have and running out of time. But time is God's. Verse 1, Jesus was promised for hundreds of years. God called Abraham. At the beginning of the Bible, God calls Abraham and says, you're going to have more descendants than the stars in the sky. And specifically that God would bless all people through his seed. In other words, through his his children and his offspring. That one day, all people would be blessed. Jesus would be the culmination of that blessing for all people. 2,000 years after God makes that promise to Abraham, 
in Luke 1, Mary sings something that's called the Magnificat. She sings a song in response to what God is doing in her life. And Mary says these words. He, God, remembered his promise to our father Abraham. 2,000 years before Mary, 4,000 years ago, the promise of Jesus is made 4,000 years ago. And then to King David in Psalm 89 and Psalm 132, God promises David in the Psalms that David will have a descendant upon his throne who will reign forever. And then we get that mirrored in Luke again. Luke 1 verse 32. I think these verses actually might appear on the screen. He will be called great and he will be called the son of the most high The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So these stories 4,000 years ago, Abraham, David, Mary, Jesus, this genealogy is important to tell us that history belongs to God. Time itself is his. Now there was an intertestamental period between the Old Testament and New Testament, 400 years No prophets, no scriptures, no passages in the Bible. And for 400 years, God's people wondering if he had forgotten them and the promises that he had made over 2,000 years before. And I think I want to share this with us. You and I cannot judge God by our calendar and our schedule. I bet you're measuring your life by your calendar at the minute, aren't you? How long is COVID going to go on for? When will this be over? I've got too much to do at the minute. We go through life at a breakneck speed, measuring life by our clock and calendar. But we would do well to be reminded at Christmas that we cannot judge God by our calendar because time itself is his. You see, we're prone to thinking that God should work on our schedule. It was so lovely to see so many of you uh, join in with um, Sharon Garlow Duda. Um, Garlo Brown, Lee, Duda, Brown, Sharon Brown, Garlo, something. Um, uh, sensible Shoes Lady, I always forget her name. And she was talking about waiting and what Advent is. And we don't like to wait for anything. Never mind Amazon, you've got Prime now, haven't we? Within two hours in London. You know, we, um, I watched a great comedy thing the other day. There's Prime before is coming. They send you stuff before you even know you need it. We're that prone to instantly, I want this resolved and fixed now we think god should intervene and do our bidding and i think actually a lot of us go through life like this i want god to do things in my life and i'd like him to do them when i need them the rest of history you know brexit what's going on in america all of history it's all a bit complicated and i hope god's doing something over there and i'm really glad that other people are involved in that with god but not me i think that's often how we think of history and time And this genealogy would say, no, history is God's and he has a place for us in it. There's a theological word, Heilsgeschichte. I remember learning that when I went to seminary and did a theology degree. And it's it's a German phrase. Things always sound better in German when you do theology. And it means salvation history. And the idea that history is about salvation and God's purposes. Not my purposes, God's purposes. And instead of this private me, God break into my life, and God, I hope you do something with other people, salvation history is that God is at work through the whole of history with his intention to save you and me and for us to participate with him in his history. Very different way to understand who we are and where we're at and what's happening. So maybe we'd ask yourself this, what story, what story and history are you living and expecting and demanding? Or do you want to become caught up in God's story for him to write history with you and co-create with you? And for me, I find that very helpful at this point in history. We will look back and we can either remember this year as COVID and surviving it and Brexit and what happened and all the craziness in America. Or we can look back and see that God was doing what he wanted to do and we can be part of it. Second thing, so that's key, the background to this genealogy. God breaks into history. Matthew doesn't begin this passage with once upon a time. 
It's not a fable. It's not a fairy tale. He is using deliberate language of a genealogy, and Matthew's writing to Jewish Christians predominantly. And when they heard a genealogy, they knew what that meant, and that's why it's extensive and long. And at the beginning, it's about credibility, it's about fact, and it's about something that really happened. This is a historical event. God has broken in, Jesus was born, and the rest of the story is that Jesus grew up, he died, and he rose from the dead. And what that means is this story is not a, that's nice for you, but this is what I'm living my life by. This is a historical event about the meaning of life, but also objective truth. This story is a claim that God is Lord of history. He is Lord of your life, my neighbor's life. Scripture tells us one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. This is not just optional. History is God's. That's the shocking claim of the Christmas story. That your life and my life and the future are all under God's sovereignty and God's assessment and God's intervention. Now C.S. Lewis is always quoted for many, many things, but there's a little sentence from him. C.S. Lewis said that in Christmas, myth became fact. Myth became fact. And here's what I think C.S. Lewis meant by that. If you and I think of the stories that impact us, really, really move us, the movies that you go to, that you tell other people about, that they do something, they move you to tears, they inspire you. Because beyond the daily grind of life, beyond suffering, betrayal, the mess of politics, as I said, COVID, um, Donald Trump and what's going on in America and Brexit and everything else, we watch stories and they do, really good stories do something to us, don't they? They tell us things that it's what's inside us that's important. They tell us that living for family is more important than being a workaholic. They tell us that no matter how much money you have in the world, you can be the poorest person in the world. They tell us about sacrifice, don't they? The best stories that you can think of. And they resonate with us. And here's why I believe they resonate with us. Because C.S. Lewis was right. All of those stories at their best point to something that is true. That's why some of the fables and the films and the stories we watch are truer than true. They reveal things that are really true about the nature of the universe. That's why we cry at them and celebrate with them and are moved by them. Because underneath it, they point to something that is true. That God is in charge of the universe and he made you and his son came for you and he loves you and he died for you. And that sacrifice and purpose are what you were made for. All those things point to this. And that's what this genealogy is telling us. This ultimate truth. God is the creator of the universe and reality. So God's time, so time is God's. God breaks into history. Third thing. God gives us a Sabbath rest. A lot of you are very tired at the minute, aren't you? Tired just because that's the way things are in COVID. Even this is weird. A bunch of pe nice people here staring at me with masks on and cables everywhere. And it just all gets a bit wearing, doesn't it? But God gives us rest. I hope you hear this if you're tired this morning. Now, Matthew was writing to Jewish Christians. I've already told you that. And the Jewish Christians knew... They knew very well the genealogy of, of the people of Israel. And it was not seven, sorry, 14, 14, and 14. There were three sections to that passage. 14 descendants, 14, and 14. And they would have been going, we know very well it's not that neat and tidy. And actually what Matthew's done is he's telescoped the genealogies. And actual fact, the word father, the word begat is probably better. It's a very old-fashioned word. The actual Greek word is genia, and it's where we get the word genesis. And it's, it's, the word is better is was the ancestor of. So he takes a few generations, and it's true. So-and-so was the ancestor of, and then skips a few and goes down the line. So even though, they, even though this is a factual thing, he compresses it. Why does he do 14, 14, and 14? And there is a reason, and, it, and if you can follow me on this, there are ways that you and I are used to writing things in the Western world. We get taught at school, if you're doing a history, you have to do things chronologically and in a certain order. 
But different people at different times in history talk about history differently for when they're talking about the truth. Now, the number 14 was very important because Jewish people knew that it was two times seven. The number seven signified the most important things in the Bible. It's not that seven was a magic number that you could put for lottery numbers. It's that that's how a, a people, before they had things written, they knew that something was true was when it was told in multiples of seven. So, if you're still with me on that, why 14? Because at this point, when Jesus arrives, we've had seven, 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 seven. Six sevens. Jesus is the beginning of the seventh seven. He is the beginning of the seventh seven. He is the fulfillment of everything that has come before. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. There is a Sabbath year in the Old Testament, every seven years when debts are supposed to be forgiven. The Jubilee year, seven times seven after 49 years, there's supposed to be a reset. In other words, for the Jewish Christians reading this, Matthew is saying this, the deepest ordering to life and creation and reality has now arrived in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rest you are looking for. Underneath every holiday that you feel that you need is Jesus, if you want to meet him. Underneath everything that you work for in life to find meaning and purpose and what you feel that you should be doing, underneath that, if you want to, it points to Jesus. Underneath your family, knowing that your family are important and how valuable they are, underneath that, if you want to, like all the stories that resonate with things in life, is Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is not just a story. He is someone to align ourselves with and a reality to live. He is the Lord of creation with power this Christmas. So God takes his time, God breaks into history, and God gives us a Sabbath rest. Last one. God gives us identity. Now, in the New Testament times, to be a great leader... Uh, to be an official anywhere, it was normal to have a genealogy. When you were introduced, so-and-so would say, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Herod, let me introduce you to Jason. Who is this Jason? Jason was the son of, the son of, the son of. And you'd have to make sure you had some good names in there for your pedigree. Otherwise, you would be dismissed. Who you were and where you were from. Now, it's amazing, isn't it? 2,000 years later, we haven't traveled very far, have we, with Instagram, Twitter, full of people being liked for who they, well, for what they look like and who they associate with. It's amazing, isn't it? Still ingrained in us, in human beings at the deepest level, is to measure ourselves by who we're in proximity to. And we get it so wrong. Nothing's changed. Now... If you were putting together, here's one of the reasons I really believe the Bible is true. Because if human beings were making up this genealogy, if God was not involved in it, this is not the story they would have told to influence people. This genealogy was utterly scandalous when it was heard. So people are listening. They're going, hmm, 1440, oh, sevens. Oh, you are talking about the fabric of the universe. And then they would have tripped over some names in this passage. Here's the first thing that people would have tripped over. Oh, by the way, um, genealogies are very important. One of the fastest growing things, even before COVID, was people getting their DNA tests done and searching their family trees online because people are desperate for identity to know where they come from and who they're related to. I remember getting excited as a kid when there was the idea that Florence Nightingale might have been in my family tree. I still haven't been able to confirm or deny that. Um, but what stands out in this genealogy? Women. Absolutely shocking. Women were regularly ritually unclean under Old Testament laws. The idea that women would be mentioned in a genealogy would never have happened. That would have been the first absolutely shocking thing. And God says, out the gate with his genealogy for Jesus, women have the highest of statuses. 
Anyone that says the Bible denigrates women has not read the genealogy of Matthew 1. Now, usually the genealogy is traced through the men, but then it's traced here through women. Rahab. Did you notice Rahab? Some of you remember Rahab. Anyone remember Rahab's occupation in the Bible? Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was also a Gentile. She was not Jewish. And yet, front and center, she is named of one of the, the antecedents of Jesus. And then it gets worse. Tamar. It's a beautiful name, Tamar, isn't it? But any of you remember the story, Tamar and Judah? Something went on there that shouldn't have gone on. Brother and sister had sex, produced a child. Jesus, traced, Jesus' genealogy is traced through women, prostitutes, and through an incestuous production of a child that most people, some of you have been watching The Crown, haven't you? If you've been watching The Crown, the cover-up by members of the extended royal family about people that they didn't want to be associated with in public. It's kind of shocking it would have been as if you found if you got a little picture there with that imagine what people would have felt they would have been horrified at this women a prostitute an incestuous relationship and then this one king david the greatest of them all did you notice that david's son solomon is named and the bible does not shy away from reminding us that Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, was originally married to somebody else called Uriah. In other words, David's adultery is called out, and the murder of the original husband of his wife, Bathsheba. Wow, great genealogy this, isn't it? And then, at the end, this one is stunning and staggering. The genealogy arrives at the male terminus. It's normal to trace a genealogy in terms of men. And God himself, through the virgin birth, makes Mary pregnant. But who gets the greatest glory at the end of this genealogy? It's Joseph, the father of Jesus, the passage tells us. Astonishing, isn't it? Not the, not the biological father, but named as the father of Jesus. And in Joseph's time, if you've been following the Impossible series, Joseph would have been shamed because of illegitimacy. He tried to divorce Mary and all the other things we know in the Christian story. And God says, this is how much I think of you, Joseph. You are named forever at the end of this genealogy. And then it says, and Mary. <laughs> Beautiful. What does that all tell us? Well, there's another genealogy. And it's mentioned by Jesus in Luke 10. And it's mentioned by Paul in Philippians chapter 4. And it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 3. And it's called the book of life. Let me read from Luke chapter 1 verse 32. Um, no, I won't read from that. Because I haven't got it down. Because <laughs> I haven't got time for all those verses. But Jesus says in Luke 10... That what we should be concerned with is that your name and my name might be written down in what Jesus called the book of life. And then Paul in Philippians chapter 4 says that Christians, those who love and know Jesus, their names are written in the book of life. And then in Revelation, an angel appearing to the apostle John and showing him the end of time, the end of history, says that this book, this genealogy, that the names of people who loved Jesus and followed him are written in that book, that genealogy. So at the end of time, do you want your name to be in that genealogy? Do you want to be in it? Do you want to be adopted into Jesus' family? Because this genealogy in the beginning of Jesus tells us that anyone can get into this family. No matter who you are, where you're from, or what you have done, you can be adopted and become part of this family. By the way, it's one of the reasons in the early church people were skeptical about becoming Christians because they would have to associate with this solid family history and tree and it was seemed to be beneath them. But those people who knew Jesus knew it was about grace and God's acceptance and love and mercy. So do you want to be in? Because it's up to you, you're invited, you can choose to be in it. But more than that, do you want this to be your family story? One day when you die, and we will all die, and people will talk about us when we are dead. 
What's the story that they will tell? Where we lived, what we owned, how much we worked, what we did? Or will they talk about the story of God's history? And I try to land this, what this means for me. My family tree. One day when I'm dead, if the news or a reporter ever looked me up, they could look up my DNA test and my family tree test, and they could say, Jason Clark was the son of Michael John Clark, who was a bigamist, married to two people with two families. Bev and I are watching a program, and there's a guy in it who's a bigamist with two families, and you go, who does that? And then I go, oh yeah, my dad did that. Kind of strange that he was married to two people at the same time. The son of Monica, a manic, depressive abuser. The great, 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 great grandson of Joseph Swan Clark, a convicted felon for stealing. That's one way, modern history, Jason, who voted, I won't tell you what I voted for Brexit, you could probably guess. Or at the end of time, here is my hope, here is what I really, truly believed. I talked last week about what I'm convinced of, I talked about how Paul says I'm convinced of this. I am convinced of this at age 51 more than ever. The one day at the end of time, raised with Jesus, I will be wandering around and I cannot wait. I've been watching the TV series The Chosen and we're all invited to watch this in the new year. And I love the character in it who plays Peter. I've always loved Peter, who opens his mouth and steps into everything without thinking, but is just so desperate to follow Jesus. And one day I want to meet Peter and I, want, and I think this will happen. This is my hope. People will say, Peter, who is this? And Peter will turn around and say, this is Jason my brother and we'll be sitting around and people will say Peter Peter tell us the story of when you met Jesus and Peter will tell the story that we see in here that's wonderfully in the TV series of when Jesus called him and Peter stopped being a fisherman and Peter stepped into salvation history and became a disciple of Jesus Christ and to talk about Peter is to talk about who Jesus is and I imagine this that when Peter's finished telling his story again, how many times is Peter going to tell that story in eternity? That he'll look over at me and he'll say, Jason, tell us your story when you became a follower of Jesus. So, you might not have seen that before in those passages. In summary, history is God's history. God breaks into, God has a rest for us. And God has an identity for us if we choose to join it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that history is yours. Lord, we feel the forces around us of alternative histories, economic history, political history, uh, demands upon us. And Lord, we pray that you would break the power of those over us. And that these, this genealogy, the truth, that Matthew talked about, the life that you then lived, Jesus, would break over us this Christmas. Break the power of all false stories and histories and may we say yes to you to become part of your family and for you to be involved in our lives and our life to be interwoven with yours. Amen.